Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sarath, for nice introduction, even though it will be flattering. Yeah. And, uh, okay. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, Advocata for giving me the opportunity to make this presentation. And uh, I have already learned a lot from very rich presentations yesterday. Now, I would like to begin with some opening remarks uh, about how this session and my presentation fit within the overall focus of the uh, conference. Uh, the president, uh, in his presentation, emphatically mentioned that there is no way out for Sri Lanka other than uh, going to sign an agreement with the IMF. And he indirectly said that we would not have faced this calamity uh, if he went to IMF uh, two years ago. Then we had a very interesting presentation by Dr. Virathai Santi Prabhu. Uh, he told us the very interesting and uh, insightful story uh, about Thailand. Now, uh, he emphasized the role of IMF uh, in the structural adjustment program uh, after the 1997-98 crisis. It was a huge IMF program with 17.2 billion uh, US dollars. But he clearly highlighted that even though IMF program helped banking restructuring and stabilizing in the country, there was a very significant domestic component in the reform process. Say, they reformed their foreign direct investment regime, and then they re uh, rewrote law to give uh, independence to the central bank, and brought new uh, ministers, people from the uh, business community to run the country, there were a lot of changes which were beyond the IMF program. The point he made was that IMF program helped, but there was a strong local component. That's a big lesson for us. Then, uh, after the IMF program, Thai economy recovered very rapidly. In my own work, I have done an analysis about the way the sources of Thai economy's recovery. Between 1999 and 2005, out of total growth increment, 75% came from tradable sectors. The reform help shifting the incentive structure from non-tradable, the construction and other things, toward the tradable sector. And export sector played a very important role in the recovery process. And uh, after that reform, Thailand has never gone to the IMF. And that is also the Asian story. Out of the five crisis-affected countries in East Asia, none of the countries have gone to the IMF after 1998, during that uh, three-decade period. Again, if you uh, look at South Asia, India had a massive reform in 1991, but India has not gone to the IMF after that. Then again, tiny economy, Bangladesh, over the last three decades, Thailand, Bangladesh has not gone to the IMF, right? They have even helped us to uh, face the crisis recently. Then the real issue is why Sri Lanka has been a repetitive IMF client. We have gone to IMF 16 times, now we are 
getting ready to uh, sign the 17th agreement. In other words, actually, when you look at financial history in the world, even though we are located in Asia, we are an African country. But all the repetitive boroughs in the world are in Africa. Angola has gone 20 times, right? Uh, then uh, Zambia is go, uh, again going to go there for the uh, 13th time. Then, even though geographically we are located in Asia, partly we are an African country. Now, why is it? We need to look at a little bit history. Now, the problem in Sri Lankan policy debate is that we are a forgetful nation. We do not... Uh, Try to learn lessons from history, right? Let me say a few things in order to set the stage for my presentation. Now, when we gain independence from the British, actually we, are, we inherited uh, not only an export-dependent economy, but also welfare-oriented economy. Uh, people forget about it, right? During the three decades leading to independence, uh, our semi-independent government introduced a lot of welfare system. We already had a free education system, free health care, uh, food rationing, free uh, distribution of rice, uh, free of charge. Everything was there in the package. It was a dynamic export-oriented economy with a strong welfare component. But during that period, we had thriving export industries. Uh, uh, in 1950, uh, by the time when we attend independent around that time, Sri Lanka was awash with foreign exchange. Our first uh, prime minister, Ms. D. S. Nanaka didn't even want to spend time uh, by talking to the IMF team. When they were here, he said, I have a lot of other important things, uh, but we are not a bigger nation. We don't need IMF, um, uh, sorry, World Bank support, right? That was the situation. Then what happened? We inherited welfare-oriented economy with a thriving export industries. Then, unfortunately, the fortune of the uh, colonial export industries started diminishing because of various reasons. But uh, the policy emphasis was more on that welfare component, right? Uh, because policymakers were already, already thinking about the next election. One prime minister even promised to bring and distribute rice from the moon. You remember, say the welfare orientation increased with a huge budget burden on the budget, but we failed to restructure the economy. During the period from 1950 until nine, uh, late 1970s, in response to challenges, uh, we implemented what I call like ostrich policies. We turn inward instead of becoming more export oriented. Uh, we don't need another example from East Asia. Look at Mauritius. Mauritius was the prison uh, for Sri Lanka. Our last prime minister was sent there as a prisoner, right? It was a useless, a hopeless country. But Mauritius started opening the economy from early 70s. Right? Now, Mauritius per capita income now is 11,000. They never want, had to go to the IMF, right? But we first turn our policy direction in the entire wrong uh, way. And then there was a uh, bold attempt in 1977 to reverse the development pattern to make the country more outward oriented. Unfortunately, the reforms were half-hearted. Uh, uh, actually, the reformers did not listen to World Bank or IMF uh, uh, to their advice in a way when they were 
prepare the reform program. It was a bold attempt, though. At the same time, civil law prevented us from benefiting from these reforms. And then reforms were broadened uh, in the early 90s, uh, and uh, there were significant gains, even though we could not become another East Asian country. Remember, 1994 election, actually the alternative party, the left-in, uh, left so-called left-in party came into power by promising to continue with liberalization reforms, simply because the gains were visible at that time. Professor Mick Moore, who talked to us yesterday, has written a beautiful article about it, why the 77 reform eventually became bipartisan policy. And uh, uh, yesterday, uh, I think his name, uh, Mr. Uh, Ajit Gunawardhana made the point that one of the most important reforms over the last 44 decades was done by left in government, uh, privatizing the plantation sector. Again, the telecom reform, all these things continue during that period. But unfortunately, after ending of the civil war, there has been a massive backtracking from these reforms. Uh, when peace came to the country, there was opportunity for us to continue with the reforms in a better way with further reforms in order to redress that massive imbalance, uh, imbalance in the economy, huge welfare orientation, but lack of dynamic uh, tradable sector. We had that opportunity, but we miss it. Now, my presentation begins with that point. Right? Uh, to summarize what I mentioned, we inherited welfare economy, and then emphasis of the policy regime for three decades was to increase the welfare network, but without thinking about providing the groundwork to continue with these policies. We became inward-oriented. Then we attempted to become outward-oriented, and the reforms did not work well. Still, uh, there were significant gain which were uh, instrumental in making the reform bipartisan. But during the post-Civil War era, there have been significant backtracking. And let me start my presentation from there. I'm going to focus on two issues. The first issue is how anti-tradable bias in the incentive structure made the Sri Lankan economy vulnerable to the present crisis, right? Here, I think you are familiar with the term tradables. Uh, I have defined them in the second slide. You can have a look at them later. Tradables are basically actual exports as well as products which are close substitute for exports, tradables. Then we have importable. Imports, imports and goods produced domestically that are close substitutes for imports. Taken together, we call them tradables. Now, our incentive structure throughout the post-independence uh, period has favored non-tradable, uh, non-tradable mean construction, utilities, and all the other services, right? Uh, and then that anti-tradable bias or pro-non-tradable bias intensified during the last three decades. That's the point I want to highlight. Secondly, how to read this anti uh, tradable bias as part of the stabilization and structural adjustment reform. Again, Thai story, stabilization itself 
is not enough. We need to restructure the economy to redress the non-tradable buyers. That's how Thailand did not, I mean, made the economy resilient to further crisis. Uh, that is the East Asian story as well. Now, yeah, this is the way I'm going to structure the rest of the presentation. Uh, little bit theory in three uh, paragraphs, debt crisis uh, uh, premier. Uh, then I'm going to discuss about anti-tradable bias and how it made the country vulnerable to the crisis. Then thirdly, I'm going to uh, focus on policies for redressing the uh, anti-tradable bias uh, as part of the IMF package. Uh, now, very briefly, debt crisis, debt or any financial crisis, is basically can be defined as lots of confidence in a country's ability to manage uh, debt or balance of payment position. A debt distress situation causing a severe disruption in the functioning of the economy. That's what has happened in Sri Lanka. Uh, there's a huge literature about why countries succumb to crisis. There are two different theories. Firstly, self-fulfilling panic theory. Now, uh, the second one, vulnerability theory. Now, what the self-fulfilling panic theory says, actually that's a huge theoretical li literature explaining the possibility of a crisis uh, even when a country is running fine. Everything looks fine, suddenly the cr country succumbs to a, cr a crisis. A crisis is prompted by a sporadic event. Uh, I will call it a trigger, striking both guilty and innocent countries alike. That was the mentality prevailed in Sri Lanka immediately after the uh, pandemic, right? Politicians say that we were fine, everything was going well, but the pandemic created this problem. Now, this idea, uh, has lost credibility actually in the financial crisis literature. Uh, trigger itself is not going to be a, create a crisis. Think about the pandemic, virus come, not everybody succumb to the uh, virus. Some people remain agile, uh, some people became sick with the virus, right? In East Asia, every country was affected by the virus, but only Sri Lanka became a problem country, right? Therefore, virus itself uh, has not been a problem. Then the more relevant theory is here, vulnerability theory. A debt crisis is caused by a combination of two things. Firstly, vulnerability. Secondly, trigger. Uh, without a trigger, crisis might not happen at, the, at a given time. But it will happen someday, right, if you are vulnerable. Vulnerability is, a, is an unstable macroeconomic condition. The, one of the uh, great economists in this area, he has nicely defined it. Vulnerability means that if something goes wrong, then suddenly a lot goes wrong. Think about Sri Lanka. We were vulnerable with a huge debt overhang uh, and uh, debt repayment obligations and so on, right? That was the vulnerable situation. Then when the trigger hit and the crisis happened, a lot went, went wrong, even political instability, uh, arrogance and everything, right? Therefore, it is a combination of vulnerability and the trigger. Therefore. Uh, we need to focus on the sources of vulnerability. Now, my focus is on how 
non-tradable bias in the economy, which intensified during the last two decades, contributed to this crisis. Now, the whole story is summarized uh, in this slide, but I am going to show some pictures to uh, uh, deepen the un understanding related to this point. Uh, firstly, what we had from about 2005, I will call it a debt-driven spurt in the uh, economy. Right? And then, the, uh, after the, particularly after the civil law, the country started building infrastructure uh, in a massive way by borrowing from initially from China and secondly from more expensive sovereign debt issues and so on. Then the growth spurt was underpinned by a massive non-tradable bias. There was a non-tradable bias in the economy, but it intensified during that period. Then what was the outcome? It was the vulnerability to COVID-19 shock. Uh, firstly, we had a massive debt overhang. Uh, by 2019, over 50 million uh, dollar denominated, mostly dollar denominated debt. Right? Then uh, by 2020, according to available estimate, our debt obligations for the coming two years was about five billion. Every year we had to uh, use uh, foreign exchange reserves equivalent to about five billion for amortization of debt as well as interest payment. Then the debt service burden as the percentage of export as well as no, uh, tradable production had increased massively. Then the reserves declined dramatically during that period. Therefore, the underlying source of the vulnerability, the outcome here was basically the debt-driven growth during that period. Now let us turn to some of the slides. This is Sri Lankan GDP growth rate per capita, uh, growth rate adjusted for population growth. Uh, you can see that during the period here, I don't have a pointer here, I don't know how to uh, You can see that during the period from about 2004-05, uh, we had the most rapidly growing period of the Sri Lankan economy. In one year, it, uh, the growth rate reached beyond 9%. And uh, during that period, uh, people were very happy without understanding the source of growth during that period, right? It is just like the difference between a strong, normal uh, wrestler and a sumo wrestler, right? A sumo wrestler is big, right? By feeding a lot of uh, non-nutritious food, fattening thing, right? But the sumo wrestler does not live long. Average life expectancy is about 30 years or 40, right? Real wrestler is very strong, but he looks relatively skinny compared to a sumo wrestler. In other words, our growth during that period was similar to a, a sumo wrestler, basically. Now, look at the data. Now, here, total tradable production, uh, basically, using national accounts, I separate a tradable production, uh, exports and exportables, and import competing goods. And uh, I don't have a time to explain how it is done. Then I have, expo uh, again, total tradable production, uh, which is the red line. Uh, the black line is uh, export, which is a more direct 
measure of tradability. Now you can see non-trade Tradable production share, in fact, has been declining. Actually, it's a, in a way natural process. When an economy grows, services share increase to a certain extent. But there was a dramatic turnaround from about mid-2010s, uh, right? The, there had been a decline, but the decline expedited during that period. Uh, showing the production structure shifting to non-tradable activities. The export story is even more telling. You can see from about late 70s, because of the market-oriented reforms, which gained impetus from the further reforms in uh, early 90s, uh, export to GDP ratio increased, right? I think in your writing, you had highlighted this point. Yeah. Now, look at what happened to that ratio. It has plummeted during this period. It declined from 20% to about 10% during that period. Therefore, the non-tradable bias in the economy during that period is very clear. Now, central bank report and many uh, people who talk in the parliament uh, show this picture or tell something similar. If you <coughs> express total debt in the country as a percentage of GDP, actually we did not have a big problem uh, in recent years. Uh, I remember when I gave a lecture at the planning ministry, the director who later became uh, again, the, he uh, made the point that the debt burden in Sri Lanka was much higher in the early 90s compared to uh, uh, recent years. But this figure, to me, is a bogus figure, simply because the denominator GDP had been weighted by non-tradable goods. Non-tradable goods do not help you to repay your debt. Right? Therefore, to get a meaningful picture, you have to go beyond the data and do better calculations. This is my better calculations. Uh, external debt relative to GD, uh, uh, tradable GDP, ignore non-tradable sector, express debt as a percentage of total tradable GDP. And then uh, even better indicator is total debt as a percentage of export earnings. Here export earnings is both merchandise export as well as uh, services export. Now, both indicators clearly indicate the problem. I mean, the, the debt dependence in the country has been historically high during this period, simply because the policy regime uh, shifted from traded orientation to non-traded sector, our debt burden relating to our ability to repay worsened during that period. Therefore, the story is complete here, right? The, and then debt service ratio accordingly had reached historical height. Then that, that is my, part of my presentation how the country became vulnerable to the crisis. Then the important lesson summarized here is be careful in comparing growth rates. Look at the sectoral composition of underlying growth. Think about the difference between a sumo wrestler and a, and a real wrestler. Then uh, I come to Sources of anti-tradable bias during that period, this is going to be the focus of our discussion, but this is the key point. Excess focus on non-tradable sectors during that period naturally tilted the incentive structure against tradable production. Uh, it happened in any country. It has a popular term called Dutch disease, because uh, the term was coined by the Economist magazine about what happened in uh, Netherlands after the discovery of North Sea oil, right? The 
huge amount of resources came to non-tradable sector, tradable sector shrank. Right? Now, that non-tradable bias built into the system was uh, exaggerated or compounded by three other factors during that period. Firstly, a chain rate policy. Now, uh, we have been making this mistake all the time. Say, you, we focus mostly on inflation and use the chain rate to tame inflation, right? Uh, it's called, you use inflation, uh, a chain rate, nominal exchange rate, as an inflation anchor, ignoring the fact that what is needed for avoiding anti-tradable biases, uh, uh, preventing appreciation of the real exchange rate, nominal exchange rate adjusted for relative prices. Look at this figure. The real exchange rate here is the black line. Uh, after the 77 reform, actually the numerical magnitude increase, that means real exchange rate appreciated, uh, improved competitiveness of the economy. That competitiveness was not retained, maintained during the uh, ensuing period, uh, simply because we intervened in the foreign exchange market to tame inflation, ignoring the uh, importance of real exchange rate in resource allocation. That pattern intensified during the last two decades, right? The pumping money into non-tradable sectors, at the same time trying to keep the nominal exchange rate virtually constant in order to tame inflation. And uh, you can see what happened here. Now, then the second point, the tariffs regime became more and more distorted. Do you know, by 2000, many people expected that we are moving towards a more uniform tariff structure. There has been significant tariff cut, but these patterns were reversed by introducing a lot of para tariffs and other quantitative restrictions. And therefore, when the trade regime become more and more protectionist, uh, it become anti-export virtually. It is the famous learner symmetry theorem. When you protect industries, and we have done it in a big way in recent years, then import uh, imp uh, the, uh, importers will make absorbent, absor abnormal profit, but export or tradable sectors suffer, right? That's the second. Thirdly, policy backsliding relating to foreign direct investment. This is a very important point. I did a study for the World Bank by digging into investment records and BOI. During 2005 and 2013, about 200 export or more export-oriented firms closed down business in this country. And uh, at that time, people were talking about a second BOI in the other tower. When investors come, they have to go to another BOI to get approval. Uh, the uh, approval process got distorted, 10% commission, all these things kill the foreign direct investment regime. Actually, I have talked to some Korean exporters, firms uh, in Seoul. They say that we, did, we will have second thought about coming to Sri Lanka at that time. Right? All the Korean investors left the country, not single one, right? Then natural non-tradable bias was intensified by policy errors during that period. Now, I think I can stop here. Then the basic, uh, can I take two minutes? I think? Yeah. Reform for redressing anti-export bias. Again, Thai story. IMF is very useful in the stabilization package, right? But the, naturally, the, the, their mission is to achieve balance of payment uh, stability virtually. Now, in Sri Lankan case, balance of payment deficit had closely followed the budget deficit. 
Therefore, that's the case in many developing countries. Therefore, IMF is going to focus mostly on fiscal consolidation. Nothing is wrong with this. Actually, that's the saying that IMF means it is mostly fiscal. IMF, right? Then why? It is natural. Sri Lanka is a twin deficit country. Our trade deficit has been mirrored in uh, budget deficit. Therefore, we are not going to blame the IMF, right? The current account deficit is approximately identical to uh, government budget deficit. Remember, identity does not mean causation. That's simple arithmetic, right? Uh, after the event, when you balance national accounts, uh, budget deficit is closely related to uh, uh, external deficit, uh, current account deficit. It does not necessarily imply that budget deficit caused the current account deficit. It is simply an identity, right? This is, I have explained in a slide, you can go through it later. Now, this is the story. You have current account deficit, which is the uh, black line. Uh, the blue line is the budget deficit, right? They have gone together. Budget deficit has closely followed the uh, current account deficit and the vice versa, the identity. But remember, in addition to that, there's a private sector deficit, which is the red line. The uh, private sector expenditure and private sector income difference between the two. Now, private sector has managed to live above the water, naturally. I mean, there's only one or two deficit. Therefore, private sector we can't blame. It is basically the public sector. But when you compare this with Thailand or other East Asian countries, the story is very different. In these countries, saving rate has been very high. Say Thai saving rate is closer to 40% compared to our about 20 around that. Therefore, even when the country is running a budget deficit, private sector has compensated for that. In the, all the Asian countries, that's the story. I have written a different paper on this issue. Government deficit uh, can be tolerated if the private sector generates more savings. It has not happened in Sri Lanka. Partly non-tradable bias can be there. That's a big research issue we have to think about, right? Uh, and then IMF approach to reform, therefore, assume a tied link between the budget deficit and the balance of payment deficit. The, that is their mission. We can't blame them, right? But the national account identity that link budget deficit to current account deficit does not necessarily imply causation running from one to another. We have to keep that in mind. Uh, taming inflation, of course, through budget, uh, fiscal operation can help improving the real exchange rate. I don't, that's a fact, right? But anti-tradable bias depend on many other factors. Again, the Thai story, you rely on uh, IMF to stabilize the economy, but take additional policy measures at the reform package to redress the anti-export bias. Therefore, in an economy where anti-export bias has underpinned vulnerability to the crisis by building up a massive debt overhang, uh, like Sri Lanka, it is necessary to combine expenditure reduction policy, that is the IMF package, uh, high interest rate, uh, and uh, taxation and other things, you need to combine them with expenditure switching policies, change in the incentive structure towards tradable sector. Again, one should not make the mistake that uh, we, are, we should talk only about exports. Imports are, import competing industries are equally important 
but you have to pro promote them, unlike Sri Lankan situation now, imposing quotas and all the things in a competitive market context. I am talking about tradables here. Uh, then just go back to uh, that slide 15. We need to, re I mean, the reverse all these three areas. Never use exchange rate, nominal exchange rate, to t only to tame inflation. But focus more on real exchange rate, because real exchange rate is the key determinant of tradable production in an economy. Therefore, some people like Rudiger Don Bush, he argued that uh, we should uh, learn to live with at least some inflation, but focus more on avoiding real exchange rate appreciation. This is a very important point for Sri Lanka. Then, uh, compare, I, if I had time, I'd have compared Sri Lanka's own ex experience and IM program with that of other countries. We went to IMF 16 times. Out of them, 12, 12 times we went there because of balance and payment problem. Then central bank know, knew how to tweak data, right? Then you can postpone investment projects or introduce temporary tariff increases and satisfy IMF, right? Then if you achieve that target, then you get money. Then when you study this uh, 16 uh, program, what we see is that we completed about seven of them and uh, tweaking had played a very big role, right? You postpone investment at the expenses of long-term growth and various things and satisfy the IMF. But this time, it has to be different. We need to combine stabilization with the reform I uh, discussed. Let us hope this trip to Washington, D.C. is going to be the 17th and the last trip. And uh, no more IMF uh, visits, uh, just like Thailand. But to achieve that objective, we need to redress anti-export bias, which had been the culprit throughout in our pro problem. I'll stop at that.